Confederacy's greatest general considered his greatest accomplishment to be a Sunday school for African American children, even when it was illegal. Now that should be a movie. Hello, and thank you for watching today's episode of That Should Be a Movie. I'm C.W. Johnson Jr. Today's book like the pitches movie is Stonewall Jacks, The Black Man's Friend by Richard G. Williams Jr. from Cumberland House. Stonewall Jackson's life is a classic American tale. An orphan boy from the mountains of West Virginia, he grew up in relative poverty. He applied to West Point, however a politician's son got the appointment, but then he dropped out, allowing Jackson to attend. At the academy, he applied himself to his studies, to the point that historians believe if he had been given one more year, he would have graduated top of his class. He then proved himself in battle during the Mexican-American War before settling down to a professorship at a Virginia Military Institute in domestic life in Lexington, Virginia. During the war, he rose to Lieutenant General and his feats became legendary. At the first battle of Manassas, he stood steadily amidst the boards like a stone wall. In his Shenandoah Valley campaign, he crisscrossed his troops over the map, defeating three armies twice his size. In the second Manassas campaign, he marched his men over 50 miles in two days and raided the Union supply base. At the Battle of Groventon, his men resorted to throwing rocks to hold the position. He captured 12,000 Union troops at Harper's Ferry, and at Chancellorsville, suddenly marched around the Union flank and drove off an army twice his size for two miles. His brilliant and audacious tactics are still studied all over the world. His life is one of great tragedies, idiosyncrasies, and contrasts. While living with his uncle after his mother's death, he would take his sister across the river to rest in an arbor he had built. His sister became a Union nurse, severing the relationship, and on his deathbed it is believed that his final thoughts were of his childhood, as his last words were, let us cross over the river and rest under the shade of the trees. He had many idiosyncrasies such as holding one hand in the air, balance his blood, and having a strict appearance to discipline with his men, but being gentle, meek, and mild around women and children. One of the great contrasts of this general that fought for the Confederacy is that he believed that slavery was wrong, should be ended, and ran a Sunday school for African American children, even when such gatherings were illegal. He even broke the law by teaching African Americans to read and write. These laws were a response to the Nat Turner Rebellion. Note, Mr. Williams' book is not an apology for slavery, but sets forth historical facts. The idea that slavery should be abolished was a relatively new idea, and even the North which profited greatly from the Atlantic slave trade and the cotton mills, as it slowly and recently ended slavery, but was not yet ready to accept African Americans as fully human with civil rights. In fact, many northern states had immigration laws barring the immigration of African Americans to their states even while the Civil War was going on. William explains how there are black slave owners and looks at the strange but true phenomenon of genuine friendships arising between slave and master. He also explains how many Southerners saw slavery as a plague on both races, as it degraded the value of hard manual labor, and wished to see it gradually ended, but realized they were trapped in an economic reality and had to adapt accordingly by making choices few of us, 160 years removed, cannot even begin to fathom. Jackson is an example of one such person. Even though he owned a few slaves during his lifetime, he treated them like family, including them in family devotions, and teaching the children the catechism. He rented one adult slave named Albert out so he could buy his freedom. While Shanks may point to examples of religious instruction being given to slaves to make them more domestic and submissive to the masters, this was not the case with Jackson. Those who knew him, such as John Preston and Robert Louis Dabney, say he desired to elevate the students in soul and mind. He viewed it as his religious duty, the same as if he had been called to be a missionary. Furthermore, there are African Americans, both slave and free, soldier, who asked to be a part of his class when they heard about it. Of General Stonewall no doubt, his interest in literacy and the African American community arose from his childhood interactions with a slave named Granny Nancy Robinson, who could read and write, and was a spiritual guide in the community. It also came from the fact that literacy had helped him rise out of poverty. When he was a boy, he taught a slave to read and write in exchange for pine knots. The slave promptly forged his past and fled to Canada. One friend remembers a 17-year-old Jackson watching a slave funeral and saying that he thought they should be free and taught to read so they could study the Bible. Critics say there is no 
definite written record of him teaching the students to read. But here's the thing. He gave the students Bibles. Why would he give his Sunday school students Bibles if he wasn't teaching them to read? He was also threatened with criminal prosecution at one point, but argued that the Sunday school was his Christian duty and thus silenced his accusers. Even after he wrote off the war, the school was still on General Jackson's mind. After the first battle of Manassas, the town Lexington gathered around to hear a letter he had written to his minister, expecting it to be news of his victory. Instead, it was his monthly donation to the school. Then, during the second Manassas campaign, he talked with a fellow officer, George H. Moffat, about the school's progress, and rejoiced that it was doing well. Note, many Virginians did not see themselves as fighting for slavery, but their homes and political sovereignty. Virginia always succeeded after Lincoln's unconstitutional call for war and troops to suppress the Lower South's independence. Lincoln's proclamations of war and blockade did not mention slavery, but collection of revenues as the purpose of the war. Honest Abe supported the Corwin Amendment, which would have made it illegal for the federal government to abolish slavery, states already committed to union. The northern states, Illinois, Ohio, and Rhode Island, ratified this amendment. So Jackson did not see himself as fighting against an abolitionists over slavery, but a tyrant over freedom. Many African Americans in the community respected and admired Jackson. When the Union troops entered Lexington, the rebel flag over Jackson's grave was lowered. But during the night, a small battle flag appeared, placed there by one of his black students. The Sunday school continued and helped contribute to Lexington's mild experience with Jim Crow. Today, in the African American Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church, there is a memorial, stained glass window, of General Jackson, placed there by descendants of his students. I believe there should be an epic biopic about Stalin Jackson, not just because he's an important figure and fascinating character in history, but because it could help lead to peace and understanding. It would show the taken down moment, the Confederates like Stonewall Jackson were human beings worthy of honor, and that the way to move on is by focusing on more important things like education. It would be a clear rebuke to the white nationalists because it shows that Stonewall Jackson stood against what they believed. Because he's an important figure in American history, whose exciting story could help the nation move on, I believe in the life of General Thomas J. Stonewall Jackson, with the themes highlighted in Stonewall Jackson, Black Man's Friend by Richard G. Williams Jr. should be moved. And, if you're looking for a way to introduce children to the remarkable human being who is Stonewall Jackson, be sure to check out Stonewall Jackson's Black Sunday School by Ricky E. Pittman, illustrated by Lynn Hosgood from Pelican Press. We see him now, the old style tat cut for his Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe, and let me know in the comment section what nuanced book from the American Civil War that violates the politically correct narrative of history you think would make a great movie that would promote peace and understanding.